Good afternoon, everyone. I hope Patricia having a wonderful Wednesday so far. Our God is certainly good and He is worthy of our praise. Amen. He is an awesome God and He's on the throne. The song in the background is um, Winds Village United Methodist Church at Kirk John Caldwell. The title is Awesome God. Give you a few seconds to like, tag, and share this video or start a watch party. As I say each week, we want as many of our seniors as possible to be a part of our virtual Bible study. And so please tag them. Lord of Lords, King of Kings. Our God is the making rule of everything. Yes, meaning, meaning he sees all, he knows all. He's ultimately in control of all. Amen. In times like these, people have this question of theodicy. Where is God? He's where he's always been. He's on the throne. He's on the throne. Yes. Let me go ahead and open with a word of prayer. I know we have so many prayer needs. And we know that our God is able to meet us at our point of need. He promised that he will both hear and answer our prayer because he is our God. And we love him. We thank him. We pray to him because we know that he's in complete control. And he has power to do exactly what we need him to do. Amen. So let us pray. Father God, right now in the name of Jesus, how we thank you that we can say with our own mouths, that we know that you are the Lord of Lords and you're the King of Kings. We know that you're the maker and creator of every living thing. And for that, we say thank you, Lord. Even as a songwriter wrote and as a choir singing even now, we can't praise you enough. We praise you, God. We praise you for being who you are. We praise you for doing what you always do. We praise you for being a very present help in our time of trouble. We praise you, God. Because your word says that praise is comely for the upright. You said in your word, Father, that you would, um, uh, that if we praise you, Father God, that you would inhabit the praise of your people. And so we praise you, Father God, with uh, some of us have concerns about uh, financial needs. And even with financial needs, we praise you because we know that you're Jehovah Jireh and that you're able to supply all of our need. And so we bind the spirit of depression, a, a spirit of anxiety. And we praise you because we know that while we're in this season, Lord, we won't even call it a season of lack or lean. We just say in the meantime, we know that you're providing for us even in the meantime father and so until we get to that place of overflow or abundance or back on a job and back in places where we're able to uh, pay our bills and do the things that we need to do to take care of ourselves we trust that you're taking care of us even now and so we pray for those people who have been furloughed who have been laid off those people Lord God who are looking for employment underemployed we pray for them even now father and we thank you that you're going to give them bread you're going to give them water you're going to take care of every need that that they have because you promised that you would father then we pray lord god for those who are sick lord with all manner of sicknesses and diseases father god nothing that is above your ability to handle nothing above your power to control nothing above what you're able to heal father and so we pray in the name of jesus that you will heal the sick and the afflicted father those who have tested positive for the uh, coronavirus we pray even now father that you will strengthen them even now father that you will give them what they need need lord god to keep going father god we come against the spirit of a lethargy we come against the spirit of uh weakness in the name of jesus and we pray lord god that you would breathe upon them afresh that they may continue to move continue lord god to do what is necessary to fight the virus lord god we know that you're able to do it in them through them and for them because you're the god over all things father and so we speak healing to them right now in the name of jesus we bind the spirit of infirmity we bind the spirit of weakness we bind the spirit of the enemy, Father God. And we thank you, Lord God, that health and healing is your children's bread. And so we speak health over them right now in the name of Jesus. For those, Lord God, who have who have lost loved ones tragically, those who have lost loved ones by natural causes, those who have lost loved ones, just so many, a myriad of things that's caused uh, uh, death, Father. We pray even now for them. We lift up our pastor right now in the name of Jesus. We lift up his grandchildren, great-grand, all of those who have been affected by the tragic 
loss of this his grandson father god we speak peace to them even now father we speak solace to them even now father comfort them as only you can father you promise in your word that you will wipe all tears from our eyes and so we pray that you're doing that even now that they're able lord god to bear up under the burden knowing father that weeping man do it for a night but joy will come give them strength to make it through the night father god we thank you right now and we pray lord god that as i open my mouth this afternoon that you will speak through me with boldness conviction clarity so that your people can hear your word people can understand your word people can receive your word and your people Lord God can be saved transformed and encouraged by the power of your word father we know that your word gives us life your word encourages us your word corrects us your word strengthens us your word prospers us father we thank you for the power of your word you said your word that when your word go out it would not return unto you void but it would accomplish that very thing you sent it out to accomplish and so we pray Lord whatever your purpose and whatever your desire is for this lesson that you've given me today that you would accomplish it even now we thank you lord god because we know that you're going to do exactly what we ask because we're asking by faith in your son jesus name and we call it done amen and thank god god bless you seniors i love you we love you we miss you and we cannot wait for the time that we can get back together in the in the walls of the church that we call the fountain of praise and praise god uh as your congregation as a family as um the, a body of believers but in the meantime we are praying that you are still staying connected with us virtually on sundays and on wednesdays at each time you have an opportunity to connect with the fountain of praise uh do that and we certainly are praying that you are in your word every day our key verse for this year seniors is thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway it does not matter how dark it is in this world if you are walking according to the word of god you have light you see god and you see which way he's leading you see what he's doing because his word illuminates the path and so we pray that you are, are remembering our key verse for this year and our key term our key uh, our focus for this year that one word exposed god is exposing some stuff i can't tell you how grateful i am for the things that god has already exposed to me about me exposed to me about other people exposed to me about how the enemy is working in this world it's a wonderful thing because whenever god exposes it's because he wants all things to be um out in the open if you will so that we would uh, know the things that we need to do to get in line amen and so sometimes god would allow uh disorientation so that we can look for him that we could see him the bible says in the book of hebrews i think it's hebrews that if we seek after him happily we shall find him and so in in this gross darkness while while so much uh uh, devastation is going on with racial tension and uh, all sorts of natural disturbances and uh, just, just just this virus steal. Um, we just thank God that we can always look for our God and see that he is at work in this world. He's not a far off. He is Emmanuel, God with us. He's the Holy Ghost, the Paracletos. He's not only with us, but he is in us and he's working for us. And the Bible says, uh, he that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. And so we thank God that we have a victory because we are born of God and his spirit lives on the inside of us. And so, uh, he's exposing some stuff this year. And then our, um, uh, so our motto is, what is our motto, seniors? I will know more Bible and be a better me. Yes, I will know more Bible and be a better me. We say again and again, week after week, that the Bible is not just for our information, but it's for our transformation. What good is a powerful word if you're living an impotent life? What good is a powerful word if you're not reading it and applying it? And so we want to read the word daily. Read the word daily. If it's only one scripture, you meditate on that one scripture. Uh, rehearse that one scripture. Uh, pray that one scripture. Sing that one scripture whatever you do get the word in your heart and in your spirit that's what we talked about last week that the word we said last week um uh, uh the lord said to us that he that his people have he has his own constitution and he has given his people his word and uh the psalmist says thy word have i hid in my heart O god that i would not sin against thee and so that's what we want to do we want to know the word study to show ourselves approved unto god a workman that needed not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word 
word of truth. We want to stay in the word of God because uh, in the word of God, we are not caught by surprise about what's going on in this world because the word of God, it is already written. There is nothing new under the storm, un under the heavens, nothing new under the heavens. Amen. It may have a different name, but there's nothing new under the heavens. And when we read the word of God, he prepares us uh, for what lies ahead. Amen. The word of God is not only speaking to our present situation, but the word of God is prophetic. He tells us what's going to happen in the days to come. And so that's the reason we need to know the word, live the word, obey the word, trust the word, believe the word. Amen. The word of God is sweeter than the honey on the honeycomb. And so here we are week three in this series of rediscovering the kingdom. And uh, week one of this, this particular series, we talked about um, the kingdom of God, that the Lord is moving us as we see beyond the wall so that we can understand that his church is not um, uh, relegated to four walls, but anybody who is born of God has the spirit of God living on the inside dwelling within that person you're part of the body of christ you are the church and so god has not called us to have church i can't wait for us to have church have church baby we be having church nah uh he's 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 concerned about his church building his kingdom that's what jesus prayed when the disciples of all the things the disciples asked lord they never asked to teach us how to perform miracles they never asked to teach us how to part the water do or raise the dead they did ask lord teach us to pray and in that model prayer for them jesus said he he said pray on this wise our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name you know it thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever uh, man, I hope I prayed that prayer right. Uh, uh, but the, the 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 words of the prayer says, "Let Thy kingdom come on earth, even as it is in heaven." And so the Lord has left us here, His ambassadors, the light of the world and the salt of the earth, to build His kingdom on earth. And we talked about that first week that the kingdom in the kingdom the king lives the territory or the domain where the king is is the kingdom and the king is the ruler he is the person in charge of the kingdom he's in charge of the peoples amen everybody every nation every tongue god is is ruler over jesus is the king of all kings amen and so we talked about the kingdom we talked about the territory we talked about constitution and i keep trying not to uh, uh rehearse or repeat or uh do a review of the past weeks because i go on and on but the constitution is, is the, the 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 royal covenant It's the covenant that god has given us and we've said before that the covenant that the god god has given us his word that he wants us to abide by is that love the lord thy god with thy heart thy mind thy soul thy strength and love thy neighbor as thyself and within that one commandment that greatest commandment we see the other commandments because when you love you're not going to steal when you love you're not going to sleep with somebody's spouse when you love them you're not going to bear false witness and so that one commandment that jesus said um jesus gave this greater commandment it encompasses the other commandments and what i said to you t the last two weeks is that the other commandments is not that the other commandments were not good the commandments are good but we are not good and because we could not keep the commandment we were doomed for hell we were doomed uh, uh, to die and go to hell because the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Amen. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so Jesus Christ has become the substitutionary sacrifice for us so that so that even when we break the law, because we have by faith accepted Jesus Christ, then we don't have to deal with the penalty of the law. Because the wage of sin is death. We don't have to deal with the penalty of the law because of grace. Somebody say grace. The unmerited favor. Amen. Somebody say grace. The grace of God. We are we, Because we are, have been uh, washed in the blood of the Lamb. We, we've confessed Jesus Christ. His Holy Spirit lives on the inside. We have his grace. We are in the dispensation of grace. Which means every day we're walking in the grace. The favor of God. And I said to you in... in years ago seniors that grace is not only the unmerited favor of god but the word grace also means the divine influence upon the heart and its reflection in the life which means i have responsibility because i'm a child of grace i have a responsibility to reflect god i have responsibility 
to respond to God because of his grace. I'm a recipient of his grace. So I have a responsibility to walk like it, to look like it, to act like it. Amen. Then we talked about we are the citizens, right? We talked about his law, those acceptable principles and standards of God. We talked about a code of ethics. And I believe we ended last week uh, talking about the army of God. That in the army of God, he has angels. He calls his, his army angels. We are angels who watch over his people and watch over his territory. And so the Lord has left us here in the earth to do his bidding. We speak up for one another. We stand for one another. We bind the spirit of the devil. And we, uh, uh, as a strong force, we speak truth to power. Why? Because we are the angels in this earth. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. Why? Because we are God's ambassadors. We are God's angels in this land, and we have the power to change things. Ooh, somebody say change things. We're not just waiting for the sweet by and by. The Lord has left us here to do some great things in the sweet now and now. We've got to change things. And we can't have the power to change things if we're murmuring, crying, complaining, and seeing things the same way sinners see things. It does not matter what's going on in the world. We've got to see deeper, farther, greater, higher. We have to see with the eyes of God. And so while they seek darkness, we see opportunity. Where they see defeat, we see opportunity where they see disaster and devastation we see opportunity for a mighty move of god amen somebody that's why jesus came to the world right that's why he came to the world right and so that's why he has left us here in the earth to do exactly what he did when he walked the earth and so we're going to pick up today with a commonwealth everybody say commonwealth or the economy a commonwealth that's uh the econ the economic security uh, which guarantees the people financial security. So the Commonwealth is the economic security that guarantees the people financial security. Uh, the reason many people are frustrated and tired and walking in fear and frantic and depressed uh, is because of the financial crisis that our country is in because of COVID-19. So many people, an uh, astronomical number of people are unemployed. So many other people are, are being laid off. Uh, and uh, we, we look at what's going on in Wall Street, although, you know, th th they had to ring the bell and to, to, well, I don't want to get into all of that because, you know, I had notes for all that. But if I go there, it's going to take me off too far. But, but whenever, whenever you start messing with money, people have a problem, right? And so we are, especially in Houston, we're having an issue now because the governor opened up the state of Texas too soon and people went back out there to work to get money. And so we find ourselves right back where we started with this virus. In fact, in a more difficult place because people are concerned about money, the loss of money. And the question is, if you dead, who going to spend that money? If you dead, how can you make money? So money, so money, money. If I say money, got my mind on my money, 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 money. And so money, money will do some strange things to people. Money will have you, lack of money will have, well, either way, lack of money will have you stand up at night. A whole lot of money have you stand up at night. Money can, can change you. That's why the Bible says the love of money. Is the root of all evil. We know we have to have money in this earth because it's our medium of exchange. That's how we uh, uh, we exchange money for goods, money for service, and so we have to have money to uh, to operate in this world. But we've got to understand that when we have God on our side, He has already made provisions for us that is not contingent contingent upon what's going on. Uh, in New York, it's not contingent upon what's going on on Wall Street. It's not contingent upon what contingent upon what's going on in our world. But God has a, a, a economic security system for His people. Deuteronomy eight and eighteen. Deuteronomy eight and eighteen. Deuteronomy eight and eighteen. I remember very clearly that I went over eighteen minutes last week, and I won't do that this week. Praise God! I told you I'm going to do better, and I will. Deuteronomy eight and eighteen. Deuteronomy 8 and 18 says, But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. And so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as it is today. Can I read that again? But remember, 
well, let me look. I like this uh, verse number 17. You may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. You, you know, we like to tell our children, grandchildren, nieces and nephews, go to school, get a good education because that's how you're going to make money. And, and that's true to a certain extent. But the word of God says in this book of law, one of those five Pentateuch books, one of these five books of law, the Lord says to his people, you may think that you get wealth just because you work hard, because you because you have a lot of skills, talent and, and ability because you you're a boss and you're a mover and you're a shaker you may think you have earned your own way that you have pulled yourself up, up by your own bootstraps but the lord says through moses to tell his people through in the book of deuteronomy the second giving of the law book that's what deutero means deuteronomy book to say this law over again uh he says you may think you've you've done this by your own hands and, and your own strength he's but the scripture says but remember the Lord, your God, for it is he. Don't forget God. When you get your money, when you get your job, when you get your degrees, when you have stuff hanging on the wall, you're driving a six-figure car, living in a seven-figure home, making a six-figure year, whatever, you're, you're part of those associations that you, you, you know, you, you wanted them now, the one of the elite now. The Lord says, don't, don't forget me. Don't forget, don't forget how you got what you have. Don't forget how you got where you are because I am the Lord, your God. I am the one who gives you the ability to produce wealth. I don't have water. He says, I'm the one who gives you uh, uh, ability to produce wealth. He says, and I've done it so that I can confirm my covenant with you, which, which I swore my father's other way. He said, he says, he says, I give you the strength, the power, the wherewithal, the intellect, the intellect, the ingenuity of uh, the ideas, the witty inventions. I've given you all of that so that I can establish my covenant through you. Come on, y'all. It, it takes money to it takes money to do ministry. And God says, but everything that you have, I have done it so that I can establish my covenant. I'm not giving you money so you can be about your own business, do your own thing, or, or, or build your own empire, produce your own your, your, your own stuff and aggrandize your own name. The Lord says, I've given you money, I've given you wealth, and I've given you the ability to get the wealth so that I may establish my covenant. What's my covenant? It's the covenant that he made Abraham. He told Abraham, I'm going to bless you and make your name great. And in you shall all the nations of the world be blessed. And so the Lord is saying, when I give you money, I'm not giving you money just so you can have more acres, more square feet, more designer clothes, more shoes, more purses, more things and stuff. I give you money and I give you wealth so that other people can have some of their needs met. So that other nations will know that I'm God. So people who are less fortunate, so that the indigent folk can look can see who I am because you have fed them amen somebody I've, I've, I've given you all that you have so that you can feed the hungry so that you could clothe the naked hello somebody I've done that not so that you could just build barns and bigger barns thou fool I have done it so that other nations and other people can be blessed through you why I want them to come to you because I'm going to trust that you're going to tell them who I am so money is not so that we can uh, 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 t you know, show off designer labels and show designer names and give them credit because we can wear their stuff. No, it's so that we can give credit to God for what God has done, for what God is able to do, for what God is doing. He wants us to highlight his name. He wants us to glorify his name. We, he wants us to show non-believers him. And so we live in one of the richest countries in the world, the richest countries in the world, but yet we are idol worshipers. Told you last week over 240 million people claim to be Christians. But we don't see Christian a whole lot of Christian activity in our earth. We see selfishness, biting and devouring. And come on, y'all. Big eyes and little U's. A uh, 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 great disparity between the rich and the poor. It's like a big gulf in between us. But yet some of us claim... We love God. So this commonwealth. So so God says, I, "You are you are my you are my wealth agent. I prosper you. I bless you. It's not the stuff. The blessing is on you. It's not your house. The blessing is on you. It's not your car because you can lose that house and lose that car. But because the blessing is on you, you will get another house. You will get another car. Ask me how I, I know." So I'm the blessing. He told Abraham, "I'm going to bless you and make your name great." Somebody tell, tell your neighbor, I'm the, well, you at home alone, possibly. Say, I'm the blessing. I'm the wealth agent. 
I, I'm the I'm the rich I'm the richest I'm the richness of the rich the richness the richness yes that's the word I'm the richness not the richest I'm the richness. When you look at me, you see the richness of God. You see the favor of God. You see the wealth of God. I, the Lord told me to tell the class some time ago, and this is a lesson he taught me and is still teaching me. Uh, you're not bringing glory to my name when you have to beg me to pay your bills every month because you're not being a good steward over your money. That's, that's not the kind of testimony I need. I need you to understand that I give you power to get wealth. And so you've got to understand and learn how to manage and properly manage what I have given you because it's not just for you. And I will stop sending blessings to you if I can't send blessings through you. And so the commonwealth, God's way of taking care of his people and his stuff. And so we turn to Malachi chapter 3. All of us should know that by heart, right? If you've been in church 10 minutes, we, we know Malachi. Malachi chapter 3, the last book of the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 3. Uh, it, it, the scriptures is talking about how can you build your own house and, and uh but you have not considered your ways. You you build you built your own house. Your house is laid, but God's house is laid laid waste. But Malachi 3 verse 10 says. Malachi 3 and 10 says, uh well, let me begin at 6. It says, I, the Lord, do not change. So you, O descendants of Jacob, Jacob, are not destroyed. Destroyed. Ever since the time of your forefathers, you have turned away from my decrees. That's, that's the word of the king, right? And have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you. That, that word return in Greek. Uh, when we talk about re re we talk about repent, repentance is meant to know. It means to turn back the back that was turned. And so whenever the Lord says return to me, he's talking about repenting. He's talking about changing your heart, the position of your heart. Uh, you were doing your own thing, your own way. Now I need you to turn your heart back to me and do it my way. You do it my way. You got to do it my way, the Lord is saying. He says, uh, return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you? The answer is in tithe and offering. You are under curse, the whole nation of you. So it talks about you, you have you have left God because you, you do now what with your money what you want to do. You're not faithful giving the Lord's tithes and offering. I know there's a big debate. People are talking about giving tithes to the church, and that's the way of the pastor and the preacher of keeping a, a, a chokehold on us or keeping us uh you know taking care of his bills. But when we look at tithe and offering, tithe proceeded the law and so when jesus came to fulfill the law he didn't do away with the tithe and now it's called grace giving but it's not to say that that's that tithing is no longer god's way because the high priest melchizedek gave tithe of the lord abraham gave tithe to the lord and that was before exodus before the giving of the law of moses on mount sinai and so tithe are very much god's way of funding his kingdom funding his church Funding his ministry, funding the way by which he's going to build his kingdom on earth, and so he says, uh, the way the way we're going to do it is not begging people uh, uh, who we know have money to give, no, but trusting everybody, trusting God that everybody who says that they trust God and are believers that they will be faithful doing what God told them to do, which is to bring the tithe and the offering. Somebody say, ouch. Somebody say, help me, Lord. And not, and, and even above that is to give a, a grace, give grace giving. Looking at how abundantly God has blessed us. And so we give to the kingdom of God. We give to the work of God uh, 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 obediently. That's how God funds his, his work. And so we see the model church in Acts chapter 2. Acts, I told you. Please remember these. Uh, I told you so. Acts is the is the only history book in the New Testament. And Acts is 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 the beginning of the church. It's the birth of the church. Uh, and, we, and we call that Acts of the Apostle when we, when we really should say Acts of the Holy Spirit. Because we see the giving of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, verse 1, right? And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one room with one accord. And the Holy Spirit came in as a mighty rushing wind, right? And so we, we begin to see the moving of the Holy Spirit. This new world. Work. 
Somebody said new work. This new work. Now we're not just listening to what man is saying. Now we're not just controlled by some priest or some prophet or some king. Now the Holy Spirit who lives on the inside, who dwells within, he is leading us and he's telling us what to do according to his word, right? The parakletos. He leads and guides us into all truth. He reminds us of what the Lord has said to us. And so the acts of the Holy Spirit, Acts chapter 2, we see this this church, this this this. The birthing of the Lord's church. When the Lord told Peter, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell should not prevail. Uh, uh, so he built his church. He builds his church upon his word. Those who confess him. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. I told you last week that the pastors are the angels of the house. But Jesus is the head of the house. So the pastor is the angel of the house, the under shepherd, but Jesus is the good shepherd. Jesus is the one through his Holy Spirit who leads and guides and directs his church. And so when the church is out of line from the pastor down to the last person in the parking lot, Jesus corrects his church. Why? Because he is the head of the church. The man is the head of the woman. And the, one, and, and the Lord Jesus is the head of his church. And so we see this church in Acts chapter 2. The, this church is this first church, this first example to us of how the Lord wants his church to function, how he wants his church to operate. We see when Peter pe preached on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 souls were saved plus others, right? 3,000 souls we know were saved. After Jesus, after Peter preached that first sermon from the upper room, uh, they went about preaching. They went about. Uh, they continued in the apostles. They continued in the apostles' doctrine and in breaking of bread and in fellowship. I like this, y'all. We got to see this because the first church didn't just wait till the Sabbath day. They didn't just wait till the first day to come together to worship God. But every day they were going to each other's houses. And what were they doing? They were reading the word. They were studying the word. They were sharing the word. They were breaking bread. They were in fellowship. They didn't just wait till the first day of the week. They didn't just wait till the whole body assembled together. But every day. They were doing house calls every day. They were stopping by each other's house and having church. I like that. While I was preparing for this Bible study, I got a call from my cousin, and she and her daughter and 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 uh, 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 friend are having Bible study at home, and they called me to ask a question. That's what we've got to do, and I believe that's why the Lord would allow the virus to shut the doors of the church because the Lord is trying to get us back to the kingdom. Some of us don't open our Bibles until we come on hill crop. Some of us don't open our Bibles until we get in, in the church, sit on the pew, and to somebody say, "Turn to your Bible." And now some of us are so bad we don't turn to our Bibles. We just Look at the monitor. But this early church, this first church, everybody was equipped with the word and they went from house to house sharing the word, sharing in what the, uh, the, the apostles told them. That's what we've got to do. Listen, I can't be your only teacher. Pastor Wright can't be your only teacher. Jeremy Wright can't be your only teacher. Or whoever your pastor or leader is, they can't be your only teacher. You've got to get this word and you've got to be teaching somebody else this word. That's the great commission that Jesus told his disciples before he ascended back to the Father. He gave them this great commission. He said, I want you to go and make other disciples, baptizing them, teaching them what I've taught you. And so we don't just, we don't just wait for somebody to teach us. We have to become teachers. Tell somebody to grow up. Amen. Somebody say, grow up. We know God is all with Jehovah. Uh, what's the word? Uh, Shama. He's always there. He's always there. He's a many breasted one. He's always there for us to feed us, to nurse, to nurse us, to, uh, to, um, uh, 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 to, to give us the milk and the word that we need, but he wants us to also grow up so that we're giving this word to other people. That's what the Hebrew writer says in, in I think Hebrews chapter 6 and 5, 6 and 7. He said, it's time for you to be teachers, but because you are not exercising the word for yourself, you're immature babes, you're still stuck on the rudimentary things or the elementary things. And so what, rather than being a teacher, you got to be taught. You're around here like Peter Pan talking about, I won't grow up, I won't grow up. You're still talking about the same stuff you've been talking about for 15 and 20 years. And the Bible says you got to grow up. And the only way you're going to grow up, you got to hear this word, apply this word, practice this word, and then teach this word to others. That's what the Jews do. They write, the, the Lord told them, write the word on the doorpost. Everywhere you go, put, put that front on your forehead. Everywhere you go, write the word. Teach somebody the word. 
Amen, somebody. So what are you going to do when you can't get with your prayer group? What are you going to get do when you can't get back to your ministry meeting? What are you going to do? You got to know the word for yourself so much so that you call other people by your side. You call other people to your house. You call other people on the Zoom. You call somebody else on the phone and you uh, study the word together. Teach each other the word. Listen, y'all, whether you know it or not, these are the days we're living in. We can't just be thinking things are going to be like they've always been because every day the Lord is soon to come. The Bible says the night is far spent and the day is at hand. It's time for us to cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light, which is Christ. Come on, y'all. We got to put on Christ, know his word and empower ourselves with the word and empower others. That's what the work of the ministry is. God didn't give us gifts so that we can shout each other under, under the pews and be glad because our names are written in lights or somebody knows us and we have 15,000 followers. That's not the purpose of, of, of being equipped. The Lord has given, he, he has equipped us with gifts, talents, and abilities. He, he has given people, uh, 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 we talk about this fivefold ministry of van, evangelists, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Come on, y'all. He's given all these gifts. Why? For the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, so that we can grow people up, so that they're not being tossed by every wind and doctrine. That's why God has given us gifts. But we're so busy just using the gifts on each other. Come on, y'all, making each other feel good, stroking each other's ego. But then we're not ministering to the world. We got to minister to the world. And it's a sad church that we can't minister until we with four or five other folk. Jesus never sent his disciples out more than two at a time. You don't need a conglomeration. You need you and one other person. You and the Holy Spirit to be about this kingdom business. Y'all, I will never forget. I was in um I was in India with my uh with the travel group. The travel group is a religious group, a Christian group. Uh, the, the leaders are Christian people. Everybody, most of the people who travel with us are Christians, but it's not necessarily that we go about to do missions work. But whenever we go on this trip together, whenever we travel together, Lord, I miss traveling together. But whenever we travel together, we always have an opportunity. We never pass the opportunity to minister as a group. But there are times when we go apart. Prime example, um, when we were in India, the group was, was getting ready to go do something. The Lord told me, no, I want you to go sit by the pool. I'm like, what? It was dark outside. Here we are in India. I forgot. I forget what city in India we were in. But the Lord told me, no, get your Bible and you just go, you know, spend some time. Go sit by the pool. And let me tell you this. When I go traveling across the world with my traveling group, I don't go with the group to be alone. I know how to travel alone. But when I go with the group, I don't go to be alone. I go to socialize and have a good time with the group. But I, I'm sensitive enough to the Holy Spirit to know what he's telling me to do. So the Lord told me, no, I want you to get your Bible. Go sit by the pool and spend some time by yourself. So so some of the ladies, I saw them in a hotel. And they said, we getting ready to go across to go shopping. Blah, blah. I just said, y'all, I'll see y'all later. So I went on the side. Outside, like the Lord was leading me, sitting on the side of the pool with my Bible. Now, mind you, it's, it was dark. I said it. I said it was at night, right? So it was dark. I could barely even see my Bible. Of course, they had torches and little lights, you know, uh, out by the pool, but I couldn't see my Bible. And I, you know, here I'm in India. I wasn't trying to use my phone and internet to use my Bible. So I had my Bible really couldn't see the words. But I had my Bible open just long enough for one of the guys who was working at the hotel to come over there and, and he he was uh speaking his own language with, he was speaking English but with a thick accent. And so uh he kept passing by me. So I started feeling some kind of way because I could tell I could tell he wasn't trying to flirt with me but he kept looking and he kept he was looking suspicious like my great nephew says he kept looking looking at me but i could tell he wasn't being flirty uh but he kept looking and i just didn't know what he was looking at so he was picking up stuff on the side of the pool and it was really nothing by the pool so eventually uh, uh one of those times he passed by he just said um he said you you reading the bible i just said yes and i just said so when he said are oh, you reading the bible that was my opportunity to just share with him my faith so he said so you reading the bible i just said yes he said you need more light i said no i'm fine and so uh so he kept moving. So he came back. He just said, so is it good that you're reading? I just said, yes, it's good. I said, God is good. I said, I'm a Christian. Are you? He said, no. He said, I'm not. He said, uh, but I, uh, I'm coming. He said, where are you from? I told him I was from America, from, uh, you know, the, the States. 
He said, you from the States? He said, I, I plan to come to the States because I have such a hard time here. We so poor and I want to go to the States to have a better life. I just said, well, you know, you can have a better life even right here. He said, yeah. He said, how can I have a better life? He said, I work hard. He said, I barely have enough money to take care of my family. We just really starving. And I, but I work hard and I barely have money to take care of my family. He said, so I have to go to America to make life better for me. I said, no. I said, you don't ever have to leave where you are to make life better. I said, yeah, there are better opportunities for employment uh, where I live in America. I said, but there are poor people in America. There are people who are dying from starvation in America. I said, uh, the, the way you have a better life is to know somebody. He said, well, who do I need to know? And I asked him to sit down and I share with him the gospel of Jesus Christ. And right there, he accepted Jesus Christ. Listen. I, and we sh we shared numbers, and I think he sent me an email once or twice. Um, but then he started writing his own language, and I couldn't understand it. And you know, then I was talking to my travel guide, and uh, just to make a long story short, uh, he accepted Jesus Christ not because it was a big missions group, but because he's the Lord put me in a place where I had an opportunity to meet this man one on one, and that's what we've got to do, believers. Yes, that there is there is strength in numbers, and we need to be unified, solidarity to church Christians, the ecumenical body of Christ. We need to come together so we can do great mission, great global work, great great local work. All that is wonderful. But you've got to understand that you are a part of the body of Christ, and wherever you go, God is, and He's in you and with you, trying to work through you to save somebody else. I was talking about economy. How did I get on that? So, so we talk about, uh, uh, so this early church in Acts chapter 2, they, they're going from house to house, breaking bread, going from house to house, uh, continuing, the Bible says, in the apostles' doctrine. In other words, they heard what pastor taught them, and so they are sharing that word with other people. And that's what we've got to do. Shame on you if, the, if, the, if you hear the word, receive it for yourself and shout, but you don't share that word with somebody else. And so Acts chapter 2, verse 44 through 47. This is what the early church did. This is what they did. And this is the model for the church. This is the model for the kingdom. This is how we build the kingdom on earth. Verse 42 says, they devoted themselves. In other words, they weren't doing it just because it was a virus going on. But from the time they accepted Jesus Christ, every day they were devoted to doing this. They were committed to doing this. Just like we get up and faithfully go to work, faithfully go get our hair done every two weeks, faithfully go get our nails done, faithfully go get a haircut, faithfully meet our, you know, do what we do, go to the golf course, the tennis course, or whatever you do, faithfully go to water aerobics. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They love the word. Woo, Lord have mercy. What would the body of Christ look like if we start loving the word like we love those housewives, like we love uh, uh, Insecure, like we love the BET Awards, if, 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 like we love our shows. What, what would the world look like if we fell in love with the word of God so much so, so that we shared the word of God in, with in as many conversations as we could, with as many people as we could. Amen, somebody. Everybody who knows you ought to know that you love the Lord and ought to know something about the word, ought to know something that the Lord has done in your life. So they, they continued, they devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine, to, to the apostles' teaching, and to the fellowship. They didn't just love the word, but then they loved each other. Woo, Lord, thank you. Come on, y'all. They loved each other. That, it's impossible to be born of God and not love people. Now, you could be born of God and love people and not like them. Come on, y'all, because I'm born of God. I love people and I love myself. There's some stuff about you that I don't like. But it's impossible to be born of God and not love. So, so they continued in fellowship. They wanted to be together because they love one another. I can't tell you how many times I call a senior and I'm just calling, check on them and end up being on the phone 15 to 20 minutes. And then they call me and share with me their videos at 4 in the morning, 5 in the morning, 11 p.m. at night. Because we miss the fellowship. We love one another. And we find a way to still be connected. Isn't it good that we can go on a parade together? Isn't it good that we can come on a Zoom call together? Isn't it good that we can talk on the phone together? Isn't it good that we can talk to each other on Facebook? Isn't it good that we could be on Instagram together, Snapchat together? Isn't it good that we could tweet together? Come on, y'all. You can always find a way to fellowship when you have love in your heart, one for another. And the Bible says that these disciples, they continued in the apostles' teaching. They continued in fellowship. And they continued and breaking up bread. They were eating together. They were taking the Lord's communion together. And in prayer. 
Listen, and they pray together. It's not just enough to talk to each other because we can share each other's thoughts. We can share thoughts and ideas. Come on, y'all. We can share conversation with each other. But until we pray together, we really haven't connected to our greatest power. Last night, we were on a prayer line with the uh, Rock Youth Church and Children's Church. Over an hour and 20 minutes, I believe, we were on the line praying for Pastor, praying for Sister uh, Wright, praying for uh, Reverend Moshe, praying for Sister Moshe, praying for uh, Jeremy, praying for the youth workers. For an hour and 20 minutes, it was. It probably was a little more than that. But we were on the phone, 11, 12 different people praying for each other. What a wonderful thing it was. Taking turns to just pray. Taking turns to read the scripture. Taking turn listen to listen to Stephanie Wright playing the piano and singing a song. Playing a keyboard and singing a song. And we were just communing together in prayer virtually. Woo! And I was in here feeling the Holy Spirit virtually. I, I, I took myself off so that they couldn't see me because I was getting happy over the prayer. Come on, y'all, sister Sher Sister Shirley, what sister? What is my what is my minister, what is my team lead name? I can't even think of her name. Sister Shirley. I can't think of her name. But close us out in prayer. I wanted to run around this house. She prayed heaven down up in my house. They continued in prayer. That's what we got to do. We got to continue in prayer. I know Sister Shelvin and Sister Sherman pray together every day, 6 in the morning. If Sister Sherman don't answer the phone, then Sister Shelvin will text me, know something is wrong. Because Sister Shelvin didn't pick Sister Sherman didn't pick up. Why? Because we have prayer partners. Two, three years ago, Deacon Sherman made sure that we don't just come together as a noon class, but you don't just sit at the table with, with these same eight people week after week. We want to call one another, check on one another. So we have prayer parties. We have a prayer box, and we have prayer parties. We pray for one another. Come on, y'all, Sister Crosby, people who are not even on, on Facebook, we continue to pray with one another. The twins, Laverne, Sandra, we pray with one another, pray for one another. Why? Because there's power in prayer. We, we, we get the strength of God when we pray. And so then the Bible says, And everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. I like this. I told you last week, and I think some of y'all probably got a little nervous because I, I tried to show you, I tried to exegete the scripture to show you that we are trying to make Peter walking on water the miracle that Jesus was trying to show him. And that was not what Jesus was trying to show him. Because if Jesus was trying to show Peter how to walk on water, then he failed. Because Peter never walked on water after he began to sink. Jesus was not trying to show Peter, how to do a miraculous thing like walking on water. He was trying to show Peter how to obey his word. He told Peter early on in ministry when he chose him as a disciple. Come on, seniors. We, we taught this lesson one on, uh, in the class in January. When he chose disciples, he told Peter was one of the ones. He says, come, let me make you fishers of men. That's what he's trying to show Peter. Teach them how to fish men. Teach them how to obey the Lord's word. That's what he's trying to teach Peter. So when Peter began to sink, the Lord put Peter back in the ship, right? In the boat, right? And then they got to the other side. It was this same Peter on the day of Pentecost. When Peter left from the upper room, he was speaking in, in a language that he had not learned. But other all the Jews heard the language being heard, the gospel being preached in their own language. And Peter preached in that day. 3,000 souls were saved. That's what Jesus was trying to teach Peter. He said, Peter, if you love me, feed my sheep. Peter, if you love me, feed my lamb. Peter, if you love me, feed my sheep. Make, make men. Peter learned that lesson. And on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 souls were saved at one, that time. Later on, 5,000 souls. Later on, other souls were saved. Why? Because these disciples learned the lesson. They learned how to obey the Lord's word, to speak the Lord's word, to teach the Lord's word. And people were being saved. Listen, they were not running after signs. Signs and wonders were following them. Hello, somebody. They will walk down the street and when people heard that the apostles were passing by, they would take the sick and the afflicted people who were dying and lay them out in the middle of the street just so that the apostles could pass by and their shadow would pass over them and people were healed. Listen, these men were so powerful because they were obedient to the word of God, obedient to walking according to the word of God that the non-believers knew that it was something miraculous about these men. They are not doing miracles. They are obeying God's word and miracles are being performed because of what they are doing. Listen, so signs and wonders follow people who believe. Signs and wonders follow people who obey. Oh, Lord, I wish I had time to tell you some of the miracles that I've seen in my life. Not because I put my hand out to my abracadabra, abracadabra. No, but because I simply obey what the Lord told me to do. And then the Lord 
manifested a miracle out of my obedience. How, come on, some of you know, you have some miracles in your life. Some miracles, not because somebody laid their hands on you and you fell out, but because you got up and did what the Lord told you to do, and then a miracle happened. And so obedience is better than sacrifice. That's what Sister Sheva put in the in the comments last week. And so signs and wonders, miracles follow people who obey. Y'all better get past this phenomenon. People are leading you into foolishness. Listen, I, I could I could I could I could I could send you links where people trying to do miraculous signs and, and dying. Because they trying to they trying to walk on water and drowning over in Africa. Trying to take up serpents and, and want the serpents to bite them and they dying from poison because they they they, they their focus is on sh showing signs and wonders. Now that's what our focus is on. I told you last week, signs and wonders are were to authenticate Jesus' identity and signs and wonders will authenticate that we are who we say we are. When we walk in obe obedience to the word of God, then signs and wonders will follow us. We don't follow, we don't look for signs. I know God is gonna move. Why? Right? Tell me, I'm looking for a miracle. I expect the impossible. I believe the come on, come on. Look, you know how I look for a miracle? Read this word. And do this word tell me to do. And then I just wait on God to do it. Lord, this is what you told me to do. And then a miracle is going to happen because I obeyed the word. Amen, somebody. And so the Bible says, the Bible says that miraculous signs were done by the apostles. Why? Because they walking in obedience, walking in faith. And so signs and wonders were happening because of their faith. Not because they just want to be known for doing signs and wonders. They just want to obey God. Listen. The verse 44 says, and all the believers were together and, and had everything in common. Selling, listen to this, their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Listen, so people try to talk about the preachers like the all do, the preachers want your money. Now, the scripture said, the apostles taught them. They learn from the apostles, the disciples, the followers, the, 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 the newly saved, the newly convert. They, they, they were walking in obedience. And because they believed the word of God, the Bible says, and because they continued in fellowship, because they continued in breaking the bread, they saw many signs and ones. And the Bible says when they got together, they wanted to make sure that there was no lack in the house. They had all things coming. In other words, they were not comparing and competing with one another. They were not satisfied that they had three designer suits and somebody was butt naked. What they did, they sold what they had and gave so that everybody could have their needs met. Oh, y'all missed that. Verse number four, they selling their possessions. Look, between 44, am I reading it right now? Because I cannot see. Between verse number 44 and 45, I'm sorry. Between verse 44 and 45, there is no other verse. What comes after 44? 45. So 44 tells us that the believers had all things common. When they got together, they had all things common. Verse 45 says, they sold their possessions and goods and gave to anyone who had a need. So there's, there's no indication, nowhere in scripture where somebody told them, sell your stuff and, and come lay it to, at the preacher's feet. Give your stuff to the to the pastor so we can give to everyone. No, the pastor didn't tell them to do that. Peter didn't tell them to do that. The apostles didn't tell them to do that. But because they were filled with the Holy Ghost, when they got together, they saw with their own eyes that somebody sitting over there don't have what I have. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take some of this excess and I'm going to sell it and come back so that everybody who comes together in this house will have their needs met. Whew, I, t I, I told some scenes, I told us this last year, scenes, I believe it was, you got a car sitting in your driveway you don't even use, and you know somebody needs a car. Will it be too much for you to fix the car up or give it to them? Tell them to fix it up? Will it be too much to share your extra cell phone? Will it be too much to give somebody else a laptop? I'm not telling you to do something that I don't do. God is my witness, but the Lord has taught me not to tell everything I do. Let your, let your good deeds be done in secret, and he'll reward you openly. But when you give, somebody say give. Give of your excess so that somebody can have their necessities met. I'll say that again. This, this, is, this, is, this is God's commonwealth. This is the economic security. God says, I've given you some stuff, but it's not just for you economic, secu economic security. For all my folk is that when I give you more than enough, it's so that you can give it to somebody else who have less faith or somebody who has less stuff or somebody who don't even believe in me so they can come to faith in me. 
So we've got to willingly give up our excess so that somebody can have their necessities met. Give of your excess. And I don't mean just because you have three suits. But I mean, don't even go buy a new one. How much more do we need? How many more new pair of shoes do you need? How many more new? Come on, y'all. Every two years, you got to have a car. Y'all could be mad at me all of y'all want to. But we know people have real needs. And we are living in gluttony. We are living in... I don't think gluttony is a word. Gluttony is for food. Well, you can still be gluttony up over other stuff but we are and this is my lesson but we 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 got a big belly big eyes and a big belly we want more we want more we want more and yet we see so many needs and sometimes we can't help meet needs because we feel it because we're feeding our greed uh the other day my cousin we were celebrating my cousin's 60th birthday and my little cousin is here from california so you know, he said uh i said you've been here a long time i didn't know you were here he said he said, well, I didn't know you were here this, we're going to be here this long. He said, well, you knew I was here. I said, yeah, because you're going to send me that old uh, text about getting some $1,200. Uh, you sent me that poor man's text. And I was joking. I was just saying, he sent me a text about they're giving money to people who have been affected by this COVID virus. And I said, oh, yeah, I saw that poor man's text you sent me. And I was joking. So he just said, oh, yeah. He said, you may not need it now, but you may need it one day. So go ahead and talk about it. And we laughed about that because he sent me a text about... COVID-19 if you need some assistance and so he said uh he said but and I didn't just send it to you I sent it so you can send it on to somebody else who may have a need listen and you know what I told him I'd send it on I had gotten that message before you gave it to me so when we get something it's not always for us sometimes when the Lord has sent a blessing to us for somebody else I never forget this one year and I one year this lady told me that she needed 800 dollars pay her rent I'm like well why are you telling me that that same day, I believe it was, I got a call to come preach for somebody. And I went to preach for them. And when I got to preach for them, when I opened up the envelope, it was exactly what this person told me that they needed. $800. And the Lord said, this, so this is not, this check is not for you. I take it back. It wasn't $800. It was $1,200. And the Lord said, no, this, this check is not for you. This check is for that person who told you they need $1,200 to pay their rent. Come on, y'all. I could give you testimony like this one after another. Come on, seniors. I, I told I told our class last week uh, uh, before uh, last year sometime we had this lesson I said uh, sometimes sometimes we have so much pride we won't we won't open up open our mouths and say we have a need and if you don't open your mouth then you won't get fed closed mouths won't get fed you can't have so much pride I want people in my business well if you have a need in order to get that need filled sometimes you got to pray to God and trust that God's gonna send somebody your way and you're not too prideful to say well yes I do have a need. And so I told, I said that in class. And so when I said that in class, one of the sisters came up to me. She said, well, Minister Burst, I didn't want to say this. She said, but you just really convicted me in class. I'm one of the people who, you know, I don't like to tell people that I have a need. She said, because people like to look at you a certain way. And she said, because I have a, a, a telephone bill that's due and my phone's going to get turned off. And I have a child who's not helping me and, and I'm just in a bad place. She said, and I really just need $50. That's what she said. And when she said that I had $50 in my pocket that somebody had just given me for my birthday. Now, listen, somebody had just given me the $50 for my birthday and I put it in my pocket. And this woman came to me after class. She said, now, I didn't want to say this, but because you said in class, I want you to know that I do have a need. I need $50 to pay my, my telephone bill. I hope this lady come online and, and won't be too ashamed to tell it. And so I said, well, you know what? I said, I don't have money. I don't know how much your bill is. I said, I don't have money. Before she said $50, I said, well, I don't have a lot of money. I said, but how much is your bill? What do you need? She said, I just need $50. And somebody had just put $50 in my hand. And I gave her that $50. And she went, when class was over, she went in a parking lot and was telling somebody else about the $50 that I gave her that, was, that she didn't want to take, and, uh, but it, it was going to help her pay her bill. And while she talking to somebody else, she got a call from her daughter and say, Mama, don't worry about all your the bills. Uh, I already paid the bill for you. So the $50 I gave her, she gave to somebody else who she was talking to in the parking lot because the person in the parking lot told her she had a need. Y'all missed that. So I'm trying to tell you, you've got to open up your mouth because God, the Bible says, give it and shall be given unto you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall me give unto your bosom. Now that scripture is not talking about money. That scripture is talking about kindness and good deeds. It's not necessarily talking about money, although it is applicable to money. Uh, so the Lord blesses us through other people. But if you don't open our mouth to say I have a need, and if you don't open your hand to share what you have, then God.